Quantum Conversations, your portal to the inner realms. Access infinite possibilities, infinite mastery, and infinite love. Mind-expanding, heart-opening conversations with some of the greatest spiritual teachers, luminaries, and healers of today's world. Usher in new earth by living in your sacred heart. Quantum Conversations is brought to you by AcousticHealth.com, home of music from the universe, online healing retreats, and this program. Claim your free registration to daily shows at AcousticHealth.com. AcousticHealth.com, your portal to the inner realms. Our program starts shortly. Welcome to another Quantum Conversation, brought to you by AcousticHealth.com. I'm Loren Gailey, and I invite you to sit back as we enter the Quantum Realm, that space of the greater part of you. It is your connection to infinite possibilities, infinite potential, and infinite mastery. And it is also the fifth dimension and beyond when we talk quantum. And in today's episode, we are going to be talking about the fifth dimension, what that truly means, how we can live it and express it and anchor it here. And my guest today is an expert on the fifth dimension, and she has written books, Waking Up in 5D. So we are going to talk about a 5D wake-up call with Maureen St. Germain. Let's welcome Maureen to Quantum Conversations. Hi, Maureen. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. It's a real treat to be with you, Lorraine. Well, I honor you, Maureen, for getting out there on the circuit to share this information and to speak before our audience. You are a great teacher of this, and it's beautiful because ever since December 21st, 2012, we in our own lives have witnessed great change, whether it's a few years before that gateway or even a few years or moments since that gateway. It is really different out there. And this is the new energy that we are working with. So we're going to talk about that in our show today. We are going to explore how we recognize when we're in the 5D and how we can truly get there and stay there. I first want to introduce you and your passion. Again, you are an author and you have traveled the world with this message. And your last name is Saint Germain. And there is a connection to the Ascended Master Saint Germain. Can you share your story of awakening with us and how it led you to this work that we're doing today? Yes. Uh, Saint Germain has been with me all of my life. Um, I certainly didn't always know it. When I was 11 years old, and given the chance to come up with a confirmation name, I could not find a name that I liked until I came across the name of St. Germain. And I remember the nuns yelling at me saying, um, you know, if you don't pick a name, we're going to pick one for you. And I remember looking at them, you know, like with squinty eyes and saying, I was under the impression this was my decision. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, then, then you know, the information came. <clears throat> so my the first time I... Um, worked with St. Germain was when I got confirmed and took that name. Um, My own awakening, I think I was born awake, to be honest, Loren, because I have always been aware of um, higher beings watching me. Mm. I have always had uh, knowing. I've always had awareness of things going on that no one else seemed to know or notice. Mm. Um... Even something simple like a, a television program where 60 Minutes was 
doing some kind of a test to see if people could notice subliminal messages to mm. prove that people couldn't see subliminal messages. And my whole family was watching, and no one saw what I saw. And I told them what I saw, and then they came on and they showed the answer key, and I was the only one who saw it. Wow. So, yeah. Um, Talk a little bit more about that real quick before moving on. What did you see? Did you see little glimpses? So it's like your brain is perceiving all of it. Well, what they did is they showed, um, I, I don't know what the speed of, of a television film is, but let's mm-hmm. say it's, you know, 250 pictures a minute or something like that. Mm-hmm. In between that, they showed other images that were unrelated. So let's say they're showing a, a garden scene, but in the middle of it, they're showing a portrait of somebody. Mm. And I saw the portrait and was able to describe it perfectly, mm-hmm. for example. And no one else even saw it. They thought I was making it up until the answer key came on. Yeah. Okay. So, and, so, and I come from a family of mystics. I don't know about my grandmother, uh-huh. but I do know my mother was quite uh, plugged in. She was also um, a good Catholic, so she tended to not... Um, you know, give it too much weight, but she would often um, say things that would turn out to be accurate. You know, like she saw, said to my dad one day, I dreamt Grandma had a heart attack this morning and died. And that morning she had a heart attack and died. Oh, um, mm-hmm. She also knew where my father was before they were married when he was caught behind enemy lines in World War II. Okay. So, yeah. So, so it anyway, runs in the family. You know, it runs in the family. And um, out of six kids, I'm the only one who actively took that lineage uh, to the next level, let's say. And mm-hmm. I began to study everything mystical I could. When I was a teenager, I was already reading Edgar Cayce. Um, as a young person, I was studying the Ascended Masters in my 20s. In my 30s, I was uh, working with the esoteric knowledge brought forward by um, Annie Besant and Blavatsky and that group. So I've acquired a lot of background knowledge. And along the way, my um, my gifts opened up even further and made it possible for me to uh, be very successful in business. And when I decided to do this work full time, I went to the altar and said, okay, If I'm supposed to do this full-time, I surrender my need to have a regular paycheck. Two weeks later, I had a pink slip, a a big check, and I was on my way. And I wasn't trying to get fired. You know, know, getting fired is kind of demoralizing until you decide that, oh, yeah, you get fired not because you didn't do your job, but because you were too good at it or too honest. And that does happen to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So um, I was the original (laughs) nonconformist. (laughs) <laughs> the original rebel. <laughs> At least in my family. I wouldn't say the original, but you understand. <laughs> I love it. So you surrendered your need for a paycheck, and two weeks later, you were set free. And so did you find that you just mind, followed keep it? Keep in mind, when, yeah, mm-hmm. when this happened, keep in mind that I still had four kids that I was raising by myself. Wow. One going into college the following year. Yeah. And... Um, Bold. Yeah, yeah. I basically I was at the place. I had been teaching workshops on the weekends in various cities, and I had a very generous vacation schedule. And so I could take off on Friday and come back Sunday night and go right back into my day job. And when I was working as a lobbyist, I was so sick. Well, when I was working as a fundraiser, I was so successful that I increased our donor base a hundredfold. When I was working with a lobbyist, I was so successful that my boss would say to me things like, I don't want you to use your intuition. I never told him I was using intuition. I never even talked about it. But (laughs) he intuited that I was using my intuition. And so these gifts that I uh, developed through study and, and prayer and devotion became the tools to help me be really good at what I did. I was writing legal briefs. I I don't have a law degree. You know, it's it's pretty wild when you think about it. And um, one of the funny things that happened when I was still working in corporate, working as a lobbyist, writing these legal briefs, 
is one day I got called into my boss's office, and he is a lawyer, and um, I wrote for a, a, a trade association, so I was writing for all the members, and then they would review my writing, and then they would either write their own position papers like that. We were appealing to um, government agencies on how they were making rulings, and he said to me, I just want to know one thing. Did they copy you, or did you copy them? Now, I knew if I told him they copied me, it would make him nuts. So I just smiled. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, (laughs) yeah. I defied every explanation. Well, that is very powerful. You are, you've used a lot of uh, this awareness in a third dimensional, we could call it a 3D job, right, in the business world. That's so how sure. did you, so, so you decided to surrender your need for a paycheck. Here you are doing some, you were doing workshops and you had a day job and then you found that you were supported. How did you find that transition then when your paycheck was taken away? Uh, well, initially, I um, was teaching a few workshops, you know, maybe two or three a month um, in Mm -hmm. various cities. And as I explained, I was traveling and and leaving on Friday. Then the second thing that happened is I applied for unemployment. And I went to the altar and said to the Ascended Master El Moria, who is the Ascended Master who oversees the ray of the will of God, I will not lie. I have applied for unemployment. I need to have a, I need to have some money here. So if, if uh, unemployment is said, that's fine. That means you guys are going to help me make up the difference. I was real clear about that. And when I went to unemployment and they held a hearing because, of course, I admitted my other income and that I had this other business. You know, and sometimes in some states you have a Shackley business and they rule out unemployment. And mm-hmm. um, they ruled that since I had held a full-time job and because as a lobbyist I was required to record my hours and show who I had applied it to, you know, what area – it, there was a there was a record of how many hours I was working in my day job, so they knew mm-hmm. I weren't I wasn't just doing twenty hours here and twenty hours there, and they said mm-hmm. as long as you were working full time, in another job, you know, in in this job, this corporate job, you're entitled to full time uh, unemployment. So the unemployment plus the seminar business I picked up matched my former income, and it was sixty k at that point. So you know it was pretty mm-hmm. substantial. Beautiful. I love those Mm -hmm. examples because it is a reinforcement for anyone who is at that crossroads themselves. And that's a lot of people, especially uh, as we're going to talk about the fifth dimension, where everything, we're all feeling this call to change things, change the systems, make Mm -hmm. them have integrity. And so Mm -hmm. uh, your story that you share... So mm-hmm. many people think that there's not enough, and right. they would be tempted mm-hmm. to fib at that unemployment hearing. And by doing that, you mm-hmm. literally, are, literally are telling the universe there's not enough. But if you go to the universe first and say, look, this is my need, this is w- what I have to do, you know, it's either going to come over here or it's going to come in over here. I don't care. You guys fix it. And that's one of the things I taught in my first book was um, you have a contract with the universe, Every time you get a paycheck, you thank the universe. Don't thank your job. Don't thank your employer. Thank the universe. And that way, if that paycheck ends, you still have a contract with the universe. Exercise your options. Yes. Okay. A lot of gratitude. So thank that contract with the universe for the paycheck. Mm -hmm. Speak to your universe, right? We really speak to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, then, then... Then if you lose this job, it doesn't mean you don't have money. It just means that resource is going to shift. Yes. It's almost as if we have to embrace the mystery, right? Embrace that mystery. Indeed. (laughs) And that's one of the things that I learned early on. There was an aspect about the meditation that I was teaching where we were expected to check in with our higher self and find out if we could proceed to the, the next level. But they never taught how to connect with your higher self. They never taught how to know for sure if it was your higher self. So then mm-hmm. I set out to create and to uh, provide a way to know. And so I went back to my higher self and asked for a method that, would, that I could teach to my students 
They would help them get 100% accuracy from their inner guidance. And so you wouldn't have to trust it anymore. You would know it. And I, I explain to people the difference between trusting and knowing is I trust that you and I will meet for lunch. I know the sun is going to come up. Mm -hmm. So if you have a higher self-connection and you truly know that it's your higher self, then when you get an answer, you can act as if it's true, even though you have no outside evidence, even in the absence of evidence. And I'll give you an example. When I got fired from another job while I was using my higher self work, and this was the job before I was working as a lobbyist, I was told the day before I would be let go. Then I was told at 11 a.m., you're going to get fired at 1. And so I From your asked, higher self? You heard that within? From my higher self. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so I asked my higher self. And, and, and the implication was, well, you're going to get fired at 1. Maybe you want to take some things out, you know, out of your <laughs> office, because maybe they won't let you take it later. So I asked my higher self, is there anything here that I will want that my employer will not let me have? And the answer was no. And so I said, well, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, use this knowledge to get an advantage. And okay. sure enough, there was one thing that the personnel manager, oh, you can't have that, blah, blah, blah. And I looked at her and I handed her the file and I said, okay, when the CEO comes back, would you mind asking her if I might have this? And of course, she happily agrees because she knows the answer is going to be no. The CEO took one look at the file and said, here, and handed it right back to me. <laughs> No harm in asking. Mm. Well, and, and to be able to act because you know your higher self has the answer. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, when I was being courted by my spouse and um, my future spouse, and I, I would say to him, you know, I don't, I don't know why, but I'm afraid of you. And this went on the entire time that he courted me. But every single time, my higher self would say, you need to do this. You know, when he'd ask me out or when he'd want to do something with me or, or make plans. And every, every single time I'd be so surprised. Really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We've been married a long time now. It's very funny. So it's interesting because you hear the message and you get the guidance. And then the next step is to take the action and follow it. In hindsight, were you able to see what was it that scared you? About him, maybe it was just uh, your higher self had to really, I guess, break through that 3D filter mind of yours and say, it's okay. He murdered me in my past life. Oh. <laughs> it's very funny. He's making it up to me now. It's what I tell people. Though. As a husband? What was that? As like? a husband. We were uh -huh. king and queen. And, oh. And he beat me and I died from it. And he was executed for it. And... um, uh -huh. um. Many, I mean, he cried when this information first came out in the Akashic Records. And um, many months later, I was able to get with someone who was a visionary, and I asked her to look at it, look at the scenario, look at, see if she could, like, time travel into that those moments. Mm -hmm. And she was able to describe that he was chasing me. And then she said, the woman is pregnant with another man's baby. Meaning me. ha, ha, ha. So uh -huh. it does not give you a license to kill, but you could see why in that, you know, many centuries ago, that might have been a reactionary kind of response. Yes, and how so. in this lifetime you are, uh, a, I don't want to say the word correcting, but it's almost a healing and it's a getting over that. Okay. It's almost well, like you're fulfilling did. a contract. I, I actually had very powerful, what I will call circular references, meaning I was time traveling back to that time for a period of about six months and and healing that situation and then coming mm -hmm. back into my 3D body. And that's a mm -hmm. whole other really big story. But mm -hmm. at the end of that, you know, it was like, okay, we're complete with that piece. Um, and my husband absolutely adores me and, you know, and it's a delight to be with him and we have so much in common and we enjoy each other's company so much. So, you know, we're both very blessed in that regard. And he is very good to me. I don't have to worry at all <laughs> in that regard. 
Wonderful. All right. So real quick before I move on in our conversation, what, you were a lobbyist. What, what were you lobbying for? I worked for the small telephone companies in um, a, a state that had a lot of phone companies. There are, you know, 20 years ago, there were a number of Midwest states that had hundreds of mom-pop telephone companies mm-hmm. because the big phone companies excuse Ma me, Bell. <laughs> would mm-hmm. not set up. So these little mom-pops <laughs> were being held to the standard of the um, big companies. And a lot of times they, they couldn't uh, make that standard reasonably. There wasn't enough money, revenue to, to cover it. And so part of my job was to appeal to the Public Service Commission to make the rules applicable in a way that would allow the small companies, the small mom-pops, to uh, fulfill some part of it without being onerous to their business. Well, that's a great skill for you. And in when we talk New Earth, and that really is the fifth dimension and beyond, that is a great skill to share as we make a transition into new earth and that's all there's almost a diplomacy there where you can negotiate um and and i just find that as a very helpful skill in our community when we all begin to create new earth systems and solutions and organizations and I mean, look at us right now with the government shutdown in the U.S. Wouldn't it be beautiful when we see non-governmental organizations spring up to maybe do uh, those services that the government does? That's kind of, I don't really like to talk about politics or the government too much, but we can see that it's, it's a bridge towards new creation one of integrity when we're talking the fifth dimension, right? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I also agree that um, many young people, many you know, um, middle-aged people are coming up with ideas, inventions, and solutions mm-hmm. that are completely bypassing the traditional systems, and those those, I'll call it alternative solutions, are literally going to become mainstream. And you can be certain of it because as you look at what um, health food was 20 years ago or 30 years ago, and you look at it now, uh, I was buying only organic when my kids were little 30 years ago. And that was very unusual. I had to go to a special store to get that food. Mm -hmm. Um, But today, you know, all your mainstream groceries have health food sections or they have organic se- sections. And and it's so wonderful to see, you know, you can go in your regular grocery store and, and, you know, get the organic kale you need or the the organic soup you need. It's wonderful. And that that is because of public demand. Consumers have created the demand. And so we are changing the reality little by little and, and, you know, the big corporations are following that lead. And I'm grateful. Okay. I love that take on it. And it's the attitude of gratitude that works here. So we are all mm-hmm. grateful for that, too. I know that um, sometimes I myself even fall into maybe a victim of the corporations. But that's a beautiful reminder. And, again, just the newness of everything, the next generation coming in with these new ideas, new systems, and actually all of us, anyone listening here, there are new ideas and new creativity coming in. So that just gives me great optimism. I've always been a well, great optimist, so wonderful. When, when my children were babies, I belonged to an organization called La Leche League, and La Leche League began a boycott against Nestle because they were pushing infant formula on third world mothers and then those mothers wouldn't have enough money to buy more milk so then they would water it down or it would get tainted Mm. somehow and it was causing huge problems and that group of nursing mothers successfully boycotted Nestle and got them to stop delivering free milk to those third world countries you you know and that, that was a long time ago so when people say to me oh you know you can't stop them my response is, 
Well, a few committed citizens will bring in a few more committed citizens, and pretty soon that action will be overwhelming. So Thank I, you're you. right. I, I end up being in the gratitude right. camp. Yes, and actually, um, so this on a bigger picture, we have chatted about this before on this show where it's a slow, I think when we look outside in the world and when we're all doing this clearing process within ourselves and um, clearing the lower energies out of our physical body uh, from the collective as well, that it boils down to humane and inhumane, some of the systems that are there. And there's so many ways we can look out in the world and see systems and structures and products and organizations and advertising that is not humane. In in a way, it is humane. And so we, the people in all aspects, we, the people for the economy, we, the people for um, disclosure, we, the people for energy, we do have a way to not accept the inhumane. And so that will, on a larger scale, require systems that are humane. This goes all the way down into mortgage companies, which we won't even call it a mortgage, but a loan mm-hmm. company, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's the optimism that we can keep our eye on the prize with the new systems that will and are coming about. So let's talk. So I a- use that phrase, in hu- okay. man's inhumanity to man, to describe <laughs> the transformation that yes. we, it's almost like God herself, God himself, put the brakes on and said, okay, enough. Enough yes. already. You've had free will. You've had a chance to, you know, play in the mud. Enough. So man's inhumanity was put to a stop. And all we are doing is reeling in that fishing line. And pretty soon the, there won't be any line left and there will only be unconditional love. You know, and I live in New York City and I love New York City and I talk to people everywhere I go. On the subway, on the elevator. Wow. And the Good. Taxi cab drivers, and it is so refreshing because everybody wants to talk, everybody wants to be friendly, everybody wants to be sweet to one another. And I'm looking around saying, that stuff that they're trying to tell us on the news or whatever, that's just to try yes. to perpetuate a lie that isn't even real anymore because mm-hmm. my day to day experience is just the opposite of what they're trying to tell us. I love that. Thank you so much, Maureen, for sharing that because, again, that's more of we the people, our experience and staying connected and this unity because if we're looking out at the news, we do not see unity. We see even newscasters pointing fingers and blaming and using words that are not very adultish. So (laughs) I love that you can step up and just do it and just be and talk with people. And so everyone listening, remember this and just reach for that. And so that brings us to the teaching of this conversation. And it really is this great shift that took place on December 21st, 2012. And it has been unfolding for much longer than that. But we have begun to see some great things happening. We can even call them miracles. And so you describe this as the fifth dimension. Mm. Well, remarkably, I was asked to lead a group that took, uh, that was with, um, was in um, Chichen Itza at, at the uh, mm. um, actual portal with Unbotsmen on that day, December 21, 2012. Mm-hmm. And what I want to say is being there was part of an initiation, and it was a true gift. I, I did not organize the group. Um, a, a bigger company did, but they handpicked me to be the leader of that group. And it's, it's still today, it amazes me. Um, and one of the things that Hanbat's men said is that it's time for the women to lead. And you're going to see more and more women leaders, and it's time for the men to step back. And women today have pushed away the male model. Twenty years ago, you know, we all dressed in blue corporate suits and white shirts and tried to look like men. In our, case too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In our in our you know straight skirt and 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 a blue blazer, 
But today, women wear whatever they want to work, and they wear what they think is appropriate for whatever it is they're doing. And it's changed because <clears throat> I remember. Um, now, what I began to realize in my own work is that we were already slipping into 5D. And again, this was an accidental discovery for me. I was having things disappear. And many people have heard me tell this story, but I'll, and I'll try to be short with it. And I began asking, where did my stuff go? And it wasn't the kind of stuff your kids take. So where did it go? And I was always told it was in a higher dimension. Mm-hmm. And then one day, instead of asking, where did my stuff go? I asked the question that I had been teaching the students to ask, and that is, what? Now, I want to segue sideways here and say, there are five interview questions. Who, what, why, when, where, and how? Every one of them, except what, gives you a piece of data so you can take action. Who took the cookies? Well, I want to find him and, and, and make him share. Why were the cookies taken? Well, we didn't put out enough fruit. When were the cookies taken? Well, at 5.30, they're not going to have dinner. You, 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 each step of that, you're asking those kinds of questions so you can solve it. But when you say what is going on, it's completely open-ended. So I began teaching the students this is the only question to be asking. When you're working with your higher self, don't ask the human question of why. Ask what. What is going on? I wonder why this is happening. And the minute you move into wonder or what, you are in a completely open-ended vehicle of information because your consciousness has not put a limitation on it because you're not expecting to take action. You're looking for information to understand. So here I am asking the question, what's going on? And I was told, well, Maureen, you were in a higher dimension when you put it down. And I thought, oh, no. I thought, <laughs> you know, my glasses, my my favorite pen or, you know, whatever, were moving into the fifth dimension as part of my practice to get ready to be fifth dimensional. It never occurred to me that I was the one that was in 5D, putting my stuff down, then sliding back into 3D, and I can't see it Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the dimensions are nested. And in 3D, you can see second and first. In 5D, you can see three and fourth. And you can participate. You can consciously participate in third, even while remaining fifth dimensional. So that was the first aha. And the second aha was when I was... With one of my sons, age 16, he came in with his backpack, threw it down, threw something in the backpack, gives me this big story, and then says, Mom, I'll tell you what I mean. Goes back to the backpack, and the item he's looking for is not there. Pulls everything out. At this point, because I'm in my own home with my own friends, I actually say to him, Oh, honey, it's probably in the higher dimensions. We'll just ask for it to come back. Now, can you imagine what my 16-year-old must have thought? So he puts everything back in a book bag comes back in the kitchen, finishes his story, and I say, okay, now go back and look. Right on top, right where it had been. Because we'd both moved into a higher pace of place, of calmness, of uh, compassion and understanding. When he was anxious, he was back down in 3D, which is a polarity reality. So one of the biggest differences between third dimension and fifth is this concept that in 3D we have polarity, and there's nothing wrong with polarity. It's simply a way to see contrast. But in 5D, we don't need polarity. We choose to abandon the not-God choice. And that's what polarity is all about. So it doesn't doesn't even mean you don't have choice. You know, a lot of people try to say, well, you know, in 5D you won't have free will, and that's not true. You have lots of free will in 5D. But the free will you have does not include a not-God choice. And when I use that term, not-God, I'm deliberately saying that instead of a bad choice or, uh, you know, whatever, because that adds polarity to it. But when I say not God choice, you're thinking, what does she mean by that? It simply means the God choices are always loving. They're always moving you closer to love. The not God choice is moving you away from love. That's all. I love that you are in New York, New York City, and you are helping promote this. That is beautiful. Okay, so... Let's talk a little bit more about the dimensions then, because we all want to really stay in 5D, and this is where immaculate awareness is required, right, so that we don't snap out of it. 
Can you talk a little bit about some of the the indicators that we are back in 3D? I mean, I guess we're in the ultimate control of it, and so anything that's not God is not 5D. A way to um, notice is the more unconditional love you are putting into your awareness, the more unconditional love you hold in your heart, the more um, you shy away from those things that are are not God. And one of the things I noticed was words that were perfectly normal words mm-hmm. were making me making me feel so uncomfortable. So I started paying attention to certain words. And I discovered all the words I have to, uh, I can't, um, um, this is good, this is the right way, this is the truth. All of those words were polarizing. And, and of course, I consider the, I have to, the worst because of two reasons. Number one, it's a polarity phrase because it's not implying that I have a choice. And number two, it's throwing the ownership of what I get to do outside of me. Who is that outside of me person that makes me have to do the laundry, meet my husband, pick up the kids? And so we are giving away our power. So one of the things that I began to understand is that if we consciously chose new words and and made a list, and the list is in the book, of the words that that were polarizing and step away from them. And, And let's start with I have to and six Every time we go to say that word, to find a new way to say what it is we want to say, I get to meet my husband for dinner. I like picking up my children on time. They are so happy when I pick them up and they're not the last one to leave. Those kinds of things then put the power back into my consciousness, and mm-hmm. I hold that power. Mm-hmm. So that's that's number one. And then this, the second thing is, anytime someone uses a polarity word, you know, I, I find like my skin crawls, you know, I'm so uncomfortable. And it's because I no longer think that way. I no longer say this is the best way to do it. I'll say this is an ideal way to do it in this, in this circumstance. Or I like that idea. Or I like that food. I don't say this is the best meal. I might say this is the best meal I've had in a long time, but that's still a little bit polarized. And this also comes wow. to this concept of the truth. How many people will mm-hmm. tell you they have the truth? And I just laugh and, and say, there is no t- the truth. It's all subjective. And that's okay. Yes, okay. Well, it's interesting because you just expanded our consciousness into um, the, the what would seemingly be a positive word, like the truth where we would convince someone. So it's a seemingly positive word, but it still is limiting. So you're opening it up. The reason it's still polarizing is because if there's truth, (coughs) excuse me, then there is falsity. So if we imply that I have the truth, that implies that maybe you have some false stuff. Now, certainly in life, we're discerning Things, you know, I I tell students, get your higher self-connection going so well that when you study with a spiritual teacher, no matter who it is, you can learn everything that they've got and know for certain if there's something there that's not a match for you. Now, you'll notice I use the word not a match. I didn't say not the truth (laughs) because not a match implies that it might be true for someone else, but it might not be true for me. And (laughs) what this does it creates a matrix of expectation that mm. we are moving into a place where the reality tolerates all choices. <laughs> and we certainly see that in many aspects. You know, you can buy something online in any color you want. Um, you can, you know, order a car with all the specialty things you want. We have pro- proactive things around um, human rights and women's rights and gender rights. And these all have opened up what used to be what was called the right way or the correct way. Um, and there's another very important part to this that absolutely challenges people. And I'd like to share it with you, and that is 
There is no more karma. 5D does not require us to keep score anymore. So we don't need karma, ours or yours, to keep score. Now, most of us are pretty willing to give up our own karma, just so long as that guy that owes me $5,000 pays me back. And I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek because it's, it's one thing. Some of us are in this place where it's one thing to forgive ourselves because we screwed up, but we still want that other guy to clean up his act. And then the reverse of those people who carry a lot of um, negative self-talk, they're willing to let the other guy off the hook, but they're not willing to let themselves off the hook. And the bottom line is, if there is no polarity in 5D, there cannot be any more karma. And it was in 1995 that I was given the download that there was no more karma. And Loren, I thought to myself, whoa, that's an interesting concept. And I thought, well, let me try it out on, you know, some, some people that I know that are devout Buddhists. They're good friends. They've studied with me. You know, they'll, they'll be a good audience for this. Well, it was not received well. And I remember saying to them, I don't know. I don't know how this can be. I just know it's true. And over time, over the last 20 or so years, what I came to understand is that Karma is what's keeping the 3D game in place. And there was a dictation that came through me from the great divine director. And he said, there's no more to keep score anymore. Can you imagine how easy it would be if everyone celebrated? And the game is over when there are no more players. Will you be the first to leave or the last? Mm. That, so it is our uh, memories yeah. and our beliefs that are holding the 3D yes. matrix in place right now because there isn't anything yes. supporting it from heaven. So I was going to ask when you were speaking there, you know, when we're in 5D, and this is by the choice of words, it's the feeling of unconditional love in the face of everything. So if we happen to snap back into 3D, could we create karma? If we come from a 3D, if we snap at someone or judge someone, does that create karma? It, well, let me it, give you a couple of scenarios to answer that. Yes. Number one, when you're 5D, people do stuff that you would normally snap at and you find yourself laughing or, or making a joke out of it. Like when my stepsister said to me that I was the ice queen, I remember thinking, wow, she knows I was a queen in the past lifetime. That's so cool. I never got, I never took in the, the, um, insult. And what happens is, oh. uh, and now you're a blonde, I'm a blonde, and I'll say this tongue in cheek, you can't insult a blonde because she only hears compliments. And I say that with the idea that you can take anything that is said to you and turn it into a compliment if you want. Yes. But what happens in 5D is you only hear the compliment part of it. You don't even notice the, the zinger or the hurtful attempt. Now, when you slide back, let's say you do slide back for whatever reason, you know, maybe you're tired or something happens that really pushes you and, and you slide back into your 3D space. And this is something very important. Nobody's becoming 5D and staying there. We're all like teenagers. One minute we act like an adult, and the next minute we act like a teenager. And that's Mm -hmm. what we're doing. We're sliding up, learning what it's like to be 5D, sliding Mm -hmm. back down. So when you slide back down and you snap at somebody, you might make karma, but it doesn't matter. Because with your clear intention that you want to be fifth dimensional as much as you can, Mm -hmm. you're actually giving yourself permission to slide back if need be and... The universe doesn't care because it's not keeping score anymore. It's like when you play checkers with a six-year-old, he does not care who wins. <laughs> they just want to play. And that's the way we have to look at 3D. We just want to play okay. in 3D. That's all we ever wanted to do. And we did that thing, which you described well, and I labeled man's inhumanity to man. And so it went too far. So now we're on our way back. And one mm-hmm. of the ways we can do that is to announce when we go to bed at night, I am waking up in 5D. And that sets the stage. So, so no matter what happens when we wake up, we have this matrix that we put out 
that we step into. So we step into our 5D clothes. It's awesome. <laughs> we're here, there, and, and there right now, baby. And we're going to work <laughs> in 5D. I love that. Okay, so we're all going to practice that tonight and do it. You, um, the, the higher self, let's talk a little bit about the higher self as well because that connection is absolutely 5D. Would you agree? Yes, it is. And I would very much like to take uh, 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 some time and explain that to, to the uh, listeners. Th- this idea of 5D and our higher self is the same. These are two different names for the same thing, like Kleenex and tissue. So okay. our fifth dimensional self is our higher self. And our higher self is not better than us. And that's what's so funny, because we call it our higher self because it has a connection to God. But it isn't better than us because we're the ones, you know, on the field playing ball. Our higher self is standing there in, in the stands giving us coaching lessons. <laughs> so, so the players are the ones that get paid high tickets, not the coaches. The coaches get paid well, but you understand what I'm saying. So that's number one. Understand that your higher self is you. And it is not better than you. It's simply a version of you that's got the goods. And the fun way to explain that is to say, if I went to the races and won $5,000, and then I told you the next week I won 10000 and the following week I won 7000 and then the following week I said, would you like to come with me to the races? You're going to say yes. You're going to bet the same thing I bet. Because you can see that I'm a winner. I'm going with her. And what happens is, in this higher self protocol that I was taught by my higher self to teach everyone else, for 45 days we play. We play like that six-year-old. We ask unimportant, insignificant questions. And we ask our higher self so we can get used to what that higher self response is. Now, we start out with a meditation where we ask higher self for a symbol or signal. It can be the word yes. It can be an itchy ear. It can be a feeling in the body. It can be a visual. It can be anything. And there are a few people that are so mental they don't get any of that. And then we have a workaround. But I won't get into that. So if you start out with a signal. And your signal can be anything. But let's say you can mm-hmm. feel a tingle in your thumb for yes. And you feel a tingle in your nose or an itchy nose for no. So then when you ask your higher self, you have to ask in a very precise way. You always ask uh, higher self. You address the higher self by name. You know, I had four children, and if I asked one of them to get me a glass of water but didn't use their name, you know what would happen. Nothing. (laughs) So you have to call your higher self by name. You also want to make sure that you're not inviting some other energy to... um, uh, uh, impersonate your higher self. And that has happened to people where they asked their, what they thought was their higher self, but they didn't say the word higher self. And then mm-hmm. when they came back and said, why did this happen? Their higher self, well, you never asked your higher self. Oh, yes, I did. No, you asked and presumed that the speaking, the, you know, the inner thought or the inner awareness of the answer was your higher self. So you always say higher self. So then you have these, these, this protocol, I call it the seven um, rules for higher self connection. The first one is you agree six weeks. I'm going to practice and play at this for six weeks, and then you you announce to yourself when that is. So if today were January 1st, six weeks would be February 15th, day after Valentine's Day. Easy to remember. So you deliberately know your forward end date, and that makes it super easy because you know you're moving towards it. Then you only ask yes no questions. You're only allowed to ask those questions two times because you're only allowed to ask unimportant questions. And if you ask the third time, you've suddenly made your playful question important. So, you know, the protocol goes like that. And you also have to set aside all your other divination tools, so no muscle testing, no pendulums, none of that, for the six weeks. Now, people often say to me, well, can you go back to that afterwards? And the answer is, of course, but you won't want to. Your higher self is always right. When I gave a lecture to a room full of 150 people who were dowsers, it was the dowsing convention in in Canada, I asked them, how many of you have had your pendulum lie to you? About 80% of the hands went up. And I was expecting the whole room's hands to go up. So, you know, I'm asking my higher self, what do I say next? And my higher self said, through me, the rest of you are in denial. And the whole room cracked up. Because it was true, the other 20%... It wasn't that they were denying it. They were just not willing to admit it. <laughs> so so that's a very important piece. 
So if you're practicing and you're asking about unimportant things and you don't ask stupid questions like, should I put on um, my right shoe or my left shoe first? Because you're going to put shoes on anyway. You're not in Hawaii running around barefoot. So you pay attention to the questions you ask. They must be unimportant, insignificant, and you must be willing to do it no matter what. So if you're eyeballing, you know, a cookie and you really want to eat it, don't ask your higher self. Just get the cookie and enjoy it. Don't ask your higher self about quitting smoking during the six weeks. That's pretty important. So you have to pay attention and only ask unimportant questions. That's really the number one thing. And then the rest of the protocol is um, very easy. It's, you know, these basic concepts of what to ask and when. And only yes, no questions. So you don't ask open-ended questions. And you're asking about what I'm supposed to do. So you don't say, is my friend going to call? You ask, am I to do blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and after you get, you know, comfortable with that, and I get a lot of inquiries, you know, when people are in their third or fourth week, and I say to people, don't ask the second last question. Ask the last question. And they, 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 they you know, kind of shake their, what do you mean? If it's raining and you're looking at your umbrella and you're trying to figure out what to do, normally you have to take a guess. You make a guess. Should I take my umbrella or not? If you have a higher self, you can ask your higher self. So you don't ask your higher self, is it going to rain all day? You ask, am I to carry this umbrella? That's the last mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we're going to recap that really quick. So it's yes and no questions. And you say to give yourself six weeks. That's interesting because I like to give myself six-week challenges where you do something for six weeks, right? And so this fits right in there. So it's a communication. And well, and there's a reason for it. There's a biological yeah. reason for it. Um, a well-known chiropractor, Donnie Epstein, uh, established that um, it takes six weeks to get new DNA. Oh. And so you're actually... The- Wow. Okay, that's just amazing because when we do something for six weeks, whether it's moving our own business along if we want to meet certain goals, that's very interesting. And so it's regarding, it's related to the DNA. We are changing our DNA. Okay, so, um, and another thing is only asking yes and no questions. That's the way... That's, I think that's another very important piece because oftentimes because it's we supposed tend to play. It's, you, you, uh-huh. know, you can't be asking open-ended questions because it's too confusing and you're going to yes. you know, fight with yourself over it. <laughs> okay, unless you're really good, but this is where we're working up to that, right? Okay. Well, and you know, Lauren, I will tell you, there are people that say, oh, I don't need that. I already have a good higher self-connection. And I laugh and say, okay, let me just ask one question. Do you follow it 100% of the time? No. No. Well, then you don't believe in it because if you follow, if you believed in it, if you knew it was accurate, yes, you would do it. Mm-hmm. So and that's so, your, that's your test. You might have a good connection with your guidance, but this will take you to perfection. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So only ask so, questions, and then you I'm said only the ask the, on, the unimportant. unimportant and insignificant. Because mm-hmm. that, that's kind of backwards from what our mental mind would take us to. We'd have to think, mm-hmm. oh, we've got to ask the important questions because I care, right? But you said only ask unimportant, insignificant questions, and that's because we You're don't like have... You're like the golf range with a bucket of balls. You're not paying attention to the balls that don't go yeah. where you want. You're paying attention to where they go. And so you're, you're, amp- you're amping up your game, and you know it's a game. And, it, you know, it's the same mm-hmm. whether you're shooting hoops and trying to improve your foul shot or any other practice, piano practice, whatever, you're deliberately making it okay to make as many mistakes as I want because my goal is to see if I can get to perfection. Uh Uh-huh. So so then the fourth thing is always follow through. That's a big deal. (laughs) Yes, I mean, I know, I mean, I guess I'm not the only one who, you know, receives the guidance and receives the creativity and puts it in notebook after notebook after notebook. <laughs> there is that time where it comes into do it, right? We need to do it. Yeah. And so yeah. very interesting. Well, that's why you ask unimportant stuff. So, you know, if you really don't like broccoli, don't be asking your higher self if you should get <laughs> broccoli for dinner tonight. You know, and that's that's really kind of the funny thing. Um, I can remember a time when I was standing at a, a, a counter 
we had all had get, had out, had bought our lunch and we were on our way out and they had all these beautiful cookies at the end and I know my class knew I loved chocolate chip cookies at that time and so somebody said Maureen did, didn't you see those cookies and I said oh yes I did and what had happened is as I saw the cookies I was in such a habit of asking my higher self said no and so when this <laughs> other person says do you, do, do you want one I, I smiled and said no no thank you <laughs> the follow through is really important and then so the fifth one is don't ask important questions. And now this is the reason I put it in reverse on number five is because there may be a time when you need to make an exception, but you make your exceptions rare. Maybe you have to tell your boss when you're going to take your vacation, or you have to make an important decision and you can't wait till the end of your six weeks practice. Fine, go ask your higher self. But understand that when you're in practice, you're in training. It's like when you go to an immersion uh, program for a foreign language. You're not allowed to talk English. You have to talk the foreign language the whole time. And mm-hmm. maybe if you're bleeding or you're in acute pain and you can't function, you might start speaking English and they'd let you. But that's an exception. And then six, don't ask predictive questions. So you don't ask, will something happen? Um, instead, you ask, am I to blah, blah, blah. So, for example, um, am, will I meet my soulmate, right, or someone uh-huh. who, who wants to meet that, or the, the way that you're saying in this six weeks practice, again, this is the practice to get connected to the higher self, you would say, and, and am I to take a different it. route home? Am I to exactly. take Exactly. Okay. Am I to stop And the other here? thing that happens is people who have really good guidance, they might actually get the message, take a different route home. They might actually see the route and the route yeah. name and everything. Mm-hmm. Then what they do is... The, what they do is they say, is this my higher self telling me to take XYZ route home? Yes, do it. I was saved from a major accident because my higher self told me to do something completely wacky. And I couldn't believe it. It was, it was to follow a truck onto the berm. And it was a semi, and, and we were both moving at 60 miles an hour on this turnoff. And I, I asked again, am I still to stay with? Yes. So I did. And then another car came the wrong way. Mm. On that ramp, I I'm not that great a driver that I might I might I don't know if I would have been able to avoid it. But this way, I wasn't even in harm's way. I didn't even see the guy till he went past me because the semi was so much bigger than me. But my higher self said, "Do it," and I checked in. Is this my higher self telling me, "Yes, do it now"? And so I did. And you can't you cannot ask your higher self this question on an important question if you haven't done the practice to know that your higher self is always right. And see, that's what happens. One of the things that people don't realize is how do we make decisions? We make decisions by our history. We make decisions by going online and writing, seeing what everybody else says about that. That's still history. It's always based on some historical data, research, consumer reports, whatever it is. We don't have a history of always being right. But if we play for six weeks... Our ego, our personality, can see clearly that our higher self was always right. At that point, Mm -hmm. we can accept with the ego mind, oh yeah, the higher self, it's got the goods, I'm with her. And then the last one, seven, no divination. No other forms of divination during your practice period. No kinesiology or muscle testing, finger testing, cards, pendulum, the whole bit. Set all that aside. Now, there is nothing wrong with divination, by the way, and I'm not saying that those things are bad. In fact, I often say, you know, a pendulum and muscle testing are really good for picking out vitamins, picking a doctor or a healthcare practitioner or a modality of healthcare, whatever, because your body knows. Your body knows mm-hmm. what it needs. And sometimes that's easier because your mind is all wrapped up and I'm in pain. So I'm not suggesting you, you completely abandon those things, but what I am saying is, once you have a higher self-connection, that connection can be so solid and so crystal clear that you won't need those other things. Mm-hmm. Yes, I have a friend, Michelle Anderson, who says she does not need those things anymore. She's got that connection. And what you're saying, again, is let's play this for three weeks. This is a, or excuse me, six weeks. This is a six-week practice for us to fully uh, it, get the experience and that experience. And enjoy it. Ex- 
exactly. and enjoy it, it becomes our truth, our own personal truth and our knowingness. So when you found that, because I'll, I'll, I do hypnosis sessions for people and we always connect with the higher self and it's very interesting to see the confidence of the higher self and it's actually like a no nonsense but a very gentle and um, a supremely loving um, aspect what do you find from your higher self what did you find from that in your own experience about your higher self traits um, it, well I like to tell people that the higher self is the version of you that's fully plugged into God and doesn't have to deal with the yeah. pain and suffering and drama that we do. And so the, the metaphor is um, I'm, I'm the businessman, I'm the businesswoman who's making the company decisions, I'm the owner. I've got a finance director and I call her up and I say, look, I want to write a check for 10 k I'm meeting the banker tomorrow, I want to pay off that balloon loan early. So she gets back to me and says, yeah, you can write that check. Did she give me permission? No. She gave me information. So I see my higher self as a resource, my new best friend, uh -huh. and a resource that knows mm -hmm. stuff about the life I'm living that I need to know. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is after the six weeks practice, let's say you're my ideal student and you do the six week practice, you develop, the, you know, you get that level of high perfection, you're confident, you're using it. Then what happens is your higher self will start coming in and telling you stuff without being asked. Yes. And that's because you've developed the rapport. Your higher self yeah. knows you need to know. Your higher self knows you want to know and, and you're allowed it's allowed to tell you. Up until this point it wasn't allowed to tell you because of free will. But now that you've used your own free will to access the higher self, all right, that door stays open and away we go. Yes, okay, beautiful connection. And that's where we're all moving into. That's yes, what we're moving is. into, right? So that's, again, that brings great optimism. And mm -hmm. I know many listening really are working on that in their own life if they're not already there and also assisting others to do it. So that is beautiful. Can we talk a little about what happens if we get snatched back down into 3D, because you said, you know, it's these things like judgment that, for one thing, that'll that'll put me back in into 3D in an instant. So what mm -hmm. can we do? What do you do to really shift? It's it's supreme awareness. Well, I do a lot of things. I work with a lot of the angels. So Lord mm -hmm. Metatron is the overseer of the polarities. And when you ask him to help you stay in 5D, then even if you slip down, calling in Lord Metatron, help me get back into my 5D self, you will. You also, when you make a mistake, usually the first thing we do is we kick ourselves. So now we're judging. Now we judge somebody else. Now we're judging ourselves for judging them. It's kind of funny when you think about it. So then you have to unhook from that and say, you know what? It doesn't matter. It truly doesn't matter. Because as long as I get it, that the only reason that game is still running is because I'm playing in it, well, I'm going to walk away from that game. Mm -hmm. And so every day, little by little, we become more and more um, fifth dimensional. I'm not, it's very interesting, one of the things I say in 5D is you don't ever have to say you're sorry because there's nothing to be sorry for. But when you're in 3D, there might be. So when I slip back, you know, or I get mad about something that my husband does or somebody close to me, you know, and I think, they know better. They shouldn't be doing that. So now me, judgment, just like you just said, right? You, I'm not talking about big judgment. I'm talking about, you know, in my face kind of judgment. And mm -hmm. then I'll, as soon as I realize it, I'll immediately apologize and say, you know, I, I want to do better. I'm, I know better. And announcing it out loud is huge. You know, I... I was teasing my husband one time and said, you know, you don't ever have to yell at me for anything because I always catch it first. <laughs> I yell uh, at myself first and then, I yell, and then I announce you, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And then I, I'm, you know, I'm allowing myself to be loving myself for <laughs> recognizing it, for accepting the imperfection and saying, I can, I can do better. And here's another really powerful little um, fix that I use every day, and I highly recommend everyone use this, and that is I ask for a day of heaven on earth for me and everyone I come in contact with. And that really 
makes the whole playing field elevated because that means now when I go to the bank teller, even if the guy in front of her gave her a hard time and she's feeling kind of owie, she takes a look at me and she's smiling and happy and bubbly because I'm holding 5D for her. Ah, oh, isn't that beautiful? Let's hold 5D for our planet. Let's hold it and we'll ask for that day. Absolutely. And you know, I know like even myself, if like right now we've got snow outside here in Colorado and if someone goes outside, comes in the house with snow on their shoes, I tend to get perturbed. But <laughs> that right, you're a nice house. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's like, hello, you know, were you raised in a barn? That sort of thing. <laughs> but it's like, if we can recognize and accept it, yes. But then there's also this matter of um, not reacting, but speaking in a loving, compassionate way. So we can exactly. Still, right. So you, you hand that person the rag and say, look, <laughs> you might have forgotten that you were supposed to take your shoes off, but can you please wipe up all those little puddles you just made? Don't and throw the towel again, at him. <laughs> <laughs> don't throw the towel. It's well said. Um, because sometimes people don't think and they don't realize what they're doing. And then the other side of it, as you have said, th- being 5D doesn't mean you can't call people out. It means you don't use anger to call them out. That's There's a, a difference. key point. Yes. Mm-hmm. Because, and you know, we're so, still living with a bunch of 3 Ders. <laughs> yeah, see, we're all here together. And so that's what we mean by being the way shower is to lead by example mm-hmm. and um, being able to stay in our power. Maybe you want to speak a little bit about this. When, when we're able to speak in a loving, compassionate way, we are staying in the power of the soul instead of coming back into 3D where we're getting um, reactionary or maybe stern with our words. <laughs> that reminds me of a moment when I um, was speaking to my husband about where he had put the dishes. And we had just moved into this new, newer um, space. And <clears throat> I said, honey, you know where this goes, but you put it here. And he looks at me. Now, I'm being really nice, but I'm being, as you said, stern or clear, you know. And he looks at me and he said, that was a mistake. And we both burst out (laughs) laughing because it was true. It was a mistake. So big deal, you know, and and just him saying it and saying it in a very matter-of-fact way, just like I had said to him, it was just hilarious. So he responded in a 5D way to me by saying, oh, that was a mistake. Uh It's hilarious. So, so we we will elevate our family members, whether they want to be elevated or not, just by our presence. You know. Yes, and and they elevate us too in in so many ways. I know my 17 year old son has said things all his life that have made me realize things from a higher perspective, and then my husband as well. I've you know he 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 may not know it. Uh, but he has always come from higher aspects as well. And so we're all here and we're all going along trying to be in 5D. And I just want to recap what you said. When we use our intention, we don't, we no longer need to try. We can use our intention and say, we are going to wake up in 5D. When I get out of this bed today, I am going to be in 5D. And I love how you said it. It's everything that is not God. It is everything that is not unconditional love. And so if it it could go down to the most mundane things like driving in a car and if someone cuts you off, there could be a reaction that we have that is not of love. It is uh, not unconditional love. And so we just be aware of it and we instantly shift it. What would you do in a case where there's, um, how would you switch like using that anger as fuel um, to amplify well, something the beautiful. Thing, the first thing I would do is I would I would I would pay attention to things that tip me off. And driving was one of the last vestiges of me, st- you know, not getting angry. So you have really picked a good one for me to show you <laughs> the triggers. So I, yes, if you can I, drive, yeah, with triggers. no triggers. <laughs> right. And so you know, other drivers who are driving without courtesy, or maybe they're not noticing who's around them. I don't know. 
So I had to think about, okay, if that's ticking me off, then I better be prepared. What am I going to say to myself when it happens? So I don't wait till I'm in that moment of frustration. I actually have thought about what my triggers are and what I would say instead. So, for example, when, when that happens now, I'll just say, oh, they must be in a much bigger hurry than I am. Mm-hmm. You know, that makes me kind of giggle. <laughs> or um, mm-hmm. um, one time when I was really upset about something and I was very distressed, I actually said, well, my angels better show me how good they are because I don't, I don't get this. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not getting what I need here. You know, and they did. They, they made some magic happen that was totally amazing. So... Think about what your triggers are and then have in your mind a way to antidote it. And if you do it, you know, like if you sat around, you know, with your family and said, okay, everybody knows I get annoyed with crappy drivers around me and you see me do this. What could I say instead and let them tell you, you know, in a playful way, you're all sitting around having a a pizza or something and you're playing, you're being playful. You might get some really good suggestions. Because because we know our our kids are way ahead of us in a lot of ways in terms of all of these things, um, they're not as triggered as we are. You know, mm-hmm. it's really really true. So that is yes. I I remember recently there was a a barking dog in my neighborhood, and so that's what we did. We we gathered the family and said, what is the best suggestion to deal with this? And it actually turned out to be beautiful, and we got together for the holidays. And so that's what we're here to do. With the dog included? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Yeah. We have uh, two grand pianos above us in our one-bedroom apartment. Oh. And sometimes they're both playing at the, being played at the same time. Uh-huh. And every once in a while, my, my husband said, They're having, they have a music school up there. And I said, I don't think so, honey. I think they've got two, you know, teenage girls that are, maybe they're twins or something, and the parents had to get one for each of them. I don't know. But once in a while, I'll go up and just say, look, you know, I, I need a break. Or on Christmas Day, I did ask them to give me a break. And they stopped. There was no problem. So it's it's very interesting when we are willing to... Say, I have this need. Can you help me? Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, again, I just love how you are in New York City, a very um, crowded place. There's lots of bodies there. You know, number one market in the U.S., and yet you are not going to be falling into the dynamics or the character of a big city person. You remain open, you share a smile, you share your voice with others, and that's beautiful. What a beautiful way shower you are for that in New York and beyond because you travel the world. I just I find that beautiful. Don't let Thank them you. don't let anyone take your humor or your light away. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. You know, I was in a cab the other day and um I said, Where are we? I, I said, Did you miss our our street? And he said, No, you're in good hands. That was the first <laughs> thing he said. You know, and it was a it was a man from Nigeria and um then he proceeds to tell me about how another um writer at a different time had banged on the, you know, the plexiglass between them. Turn around, you're going the wrong way, blah, 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 screaming at him. And, you know, he's on the freeway trying to drive, and he handled it, and and, uh, he said, no, no, look, you'll see, we are going the right way. And then as soon as the woman realized it, he said she was so apologetic. He said, I finally had to say to her, it's okay, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. And him telling me that story, (laughs) excuse me, is my proof that this heart-centeredness in New York City has filtered to everyone. And it began at 9-11, when everyone realized they had to stick together. Mm. And, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, yeah. a cab driver, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's got to work so hard and know so much. Um, and when he said to me, you're in good hands, I said, that's, that's your new best phrase. Oh, and another mm-hmm. time when I was with a cab, somebody was honking, and this guy got all worked up, you know, and I, I said, oh, don't worry about it, you know, this, people honk, you know, it's nothing. And I said, you know what I say when, when I'm driving and people are honking at me? And he said, what? And I said, I say, they must really like me. 
And he <laughs> burst out laughing. And and he, I said, so now when somebody honks, you just say to yourself, they must really like me. And, thank and you. Going, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm going to do that too. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> See, thank you, though, is a little bit too, um, what's the word? Um, um, it's it's too it's too much. We use that word a lot. So, but when you when you change it into you know they must really like me or something that oh that's a nice compliment. It forces you to own those words. Thank you can be a little bit. Um, you can be unhooked from thank you is what I'm trying to say. A person can be unhooked from thank you. Yes, and so while we're on the subject, I think a simple hand wave. When I was on Guam uh, in the 90s, um, there were a lot of um, expatriates and outside people coming into that island, and they did a campaign. The Tourism Bureau did a campaign, and it was everybody show the wave. <laughs> and at first, we kind of laughed about it. But now, 20 years later, 25 years later, I realize, wow, it is so simple. Just a little hand wave. And so... That's a powerful tool as well. That's cool. I mm-hmm. love that. We don't have to speak. You just wave. Just put your hand up and wave. And it really I does it. bring a different vibration. So we wave <laughs> and we stay centered in the heart. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. That's true. That's true. The hand is connected to the heart. Waving does activate the heart. Beautiful. What a beautiful conversation. Uh, I hope that all of our uh, uh, community listening can really feel this deeper connection into being in 5D, staying in 5D, how we can avoid um, that snap back into 3D and how we can easily shift back out of it. And also, I would love for everyone to play that six-week challenge of the practice of connecting to the higher self in this very pure way because it's a beautiful foundation for even more wisdom to come through. I agree. I think it would be lovely if they would do that. It's a very powerful tool. Yes, thank you for sharing that. And you have teachings, and there are ways for people to get involved with your teachings. Those are in digital download because you've done a lot of work and you've recorded these. So share Mm -hmm. with us your special offer and how people can work with these and what they can expect to um, benefit from from these courses. So the first thing is a waking up in 5D Telesummit, and I interviewed 22 um, spiritual teachers and asked them for their 5D experiences and knowledge and sharings. And so that package of, of 11 hours um, is part of this package that I'm including for the um, listeners if they decide they want to get it. And it's a very broad brushstrokes and very solid, wonderful information. It's loaded with information. And then the second item is what we call a 5D immersion. And this is 12 lessons that I did, one on each chapter of the book, Waking Up in 5D. And I go, I dive deep. So you get a written lesson and you get a video of me explaining things. And the higher self connection is in there as well. Um, So it allows the uh, uh, listener who's working with that information or the you know person who's watching to um, because some of there's video there for them to really get the, the the sense of what this is like and every every lesson becomes more and more powerful because as my audience grew and more and more people signed up then that program just kind of had a life of its own and so that was the first year after the book came out um, we did a, a year long program where we took people through each each chapter. Um, and then uh, one of the things that I like to um, tell people is that a lot of these things you're already doing, but you didn't know to do them proactively. I grew up sewing, and when I went to um, night school for, you know, Fashion Institute just for pleasure, I was surprised at how much I knew. And you may be surprised that you know some of this stuff. But what we're doing is literally teaching you to do these things consistently, 
proactively, purposefully, so that you can always anchor yourself in 5D. And the more of us that are anchored in 5D, the fewer there will be playing that 3D game. And as the Master said, the game is over when the last player leaves. And so are you going to be the last player? Are you here to help all players get out? Uh, That's a good question. I don't see myself as the last player. I see myself as the coach calling them out. Okay, the coach. The next game. Mm. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I can envision that world. It's already here. Um, when we when we gather like this and we share stories like this, you know, you talking to um, people in New York City, those stories don't make it into the mainstream news. And so it's <laughs> wonderful to to know that this stuff is going on. And that's why we love to share those stories and stories of the awakening. And, you know, for you in New York City, 9-11 was a big awakening call. And so that really started, you know, 10, 11 years before the great gateway of 2012. But uh, Well, I guess we needed a running beautiful. start. <laughs> you had a running start. Yeah, I, know, I, I know. What I was saying is we needed a running start, you know, like you give somebody a, a little advantage, you know, like in golf. <laughs> a head start, it. yes. A head start, yeah. Well, so. I am so honored to have you speak with us today and to share that six-week challenge, let's call it the Higher Self Connection, and your special offer, so beautiful for those who want to dive deep into your work. It is available in the special offer. That is available at AcousticHealth.com forward slash special offers forward slash the 5D wake up. And that is with Maureen St. Germain, a powerful fifth dimensional teacher and way shower. So Maureen, as we say goodbye, I just want to give you a moment to wrap up our conversation and close our circle. Thank you. So I want to invite each of you to ask for a day of heaven on earth for yourself and everyone you come in contact with or everyone you are in contract with. And I also want to invite you to ask to wake up in 5D and then when you wake up, I am waking up in 5D. Beautiful. We'll see everyone in 5D. Awesome. It's here. And it begins with our hearts. Maureen St. Germain, thank you for being aware. Thank you for being born aware and awake. And for being a beautiful way shower for our beloved planet and humanity. Thank you. Thank and you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lauren, for giving people like me the opportunity to share our story. It is my pleasure. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Again, you can access Marine St. Germain's special offer with a link on this webpage or this YouTube channel. So now it is time to dance our way to the cosmic heart. This is where we can move our body or at least just move our heart to the rhythm with our intention as we send it across the universe. Blessings to you. Namaste.
thank you for listening to this quantum conversation and thank you for dancing with us to the cosmic heart as we raise our own vibration we raise the vibration of the planet this show is dedicated to you and all awakening hearts as we are here to shine our bright light and amplify our love access all quantum conversations special offers from our guests and online healing retreats by visiting AcousticHealth.com. I'm Loren Gailey, and from my sacred heart to yours, I honor your magnificent love and light. We leave you now with music from the universe, music literally created by the universe as musical notes were assigned to mathematical equations. The result is this beautiful music, available at AcousticHealth.com. Namaste. Namaste.